Welcome to this latest edition of Brazos Valley Voices and a visit with another veteran. U.S. Air Force, Vietnam, A&M class of 1952. His name was Curtis Burns. This interview was on November the 10th, 2006. Major Kurt Burns was an airman with plenty of passion and little fear. He grew up in a home about where G. Raleigh White Coliseum once stood. He piloted five different jet fighters during his service in Europe and in Vietnam. He spent 20 years as an Air Force pilot and logged more than 5,000 hours in the air. In retirement, he was the coach of Texas A&M's national championship pistol team. We lost Curtis Burns on January the 19th, 2012. Enjoy this visit that I had in his home with Curtis Burns. Okay. Two guns that are A1 sight and right. bomb shackles. Yeah. But I don't have a T-33. But uh, my first, I guess you may saw, call it a first real fighter, was uh -huh. uh, the F-86 that I flew at Nellis. Right. Um, flew the E's and the F's, which are both day fighter models. Okay. And then I was fortunate, I was high enough in my class, none of our class of 15 um, got fighter assignments. I uh -huh. sent all the basic schools to right. teach students and I right. chose, I was high enough to where I chose Willie, which Williams Air Force Base, uh -huh. which was the premier uh, training base at the time. I see. Uh -huh. And... Uh, Again, I was fortunate because about a year after that, they decided to, they moved the entire F-86 training program mm -hmm. from Nellistown to Willie, mm -hmm. Williams, and yes, uh, kept, um, well, they actually started training in F-100, so I got to instruct and uh, for about a year, and a year and a half, something like that. Uh huh. In the F-86. I see. And uh, at Williams. And then I got an assignment over to uh, Germany to a fighter day uh, squadron. It was air superiority, they called it fighter day at the time. It was right. Day fighters. And the F-100C. Mm -hmm. And boy, I'll tell you, the C model was a real challenging airplane. It uh, had a high accident rate. Well, one of the reasons which was number of things about the airplane that were not as reliable as it should be. I understand. It's a first, first generation supersonic fighter. Uh -huh. That was this F-100 here. Uh -huh. um, actually, that's a D model and I flew the C. Right. The basic difference between the two, the C model did not have any flaps. Oh, okay. Had inboard ailerons, uh -huh. whereas the D model had conventional flaps and ailerons outboard. Yeah. And uh, because it didn't have any flaps, the uh, Final approach speed was much higher than most airplanes at the time. Mm -hmm. About 190, 195 knots coming down the final. Right, right. right. And uh, we were flattered over in Germany where all the runways are only about 7,900 feet. And as we said, 7,900 feet and always wet. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, it was a uh, very challenging, very interesting experience. I, I loved it. Yeah. And then about halfway through my tour over there, they, um, in Germany? In Germany. Uh -huh. it, it was, at the time they called it Landstuhl Air Base, but um, they later uh, combined it into, renamed it Ramstein. Mm -hmm. What they had, they had the headquarters on one side of the Autobahn was Ramstein, and on the other side was the, the uh, flight line, the runway, and the three fighter squadrons, as I recall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, we, then we, uh, they changed the mission of the 53rd as well as the whole 36th wing to uh, 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 nuclear strike mission. So uh, uh, the, big, the big difference was uh, instead of sitting air defense alert, we were sitting nuclear alert. And mm -hmm. You never flew when you had an atomic bomb hanging on the airplane because mm -hmm. fighters had a... Uh, Disturbing propensity for dropping off ordnance occasionally, you know. Mm -hmm. I didn't want somebody dropping a 
Mark 7 atomic bomb through, mm. even though it wasn't armed, but uh, yeah. through some church. But <laughs> right. right. Like we did one day, uh, uh, some fuel tanks dropped off and fell through a church, into a church, kind of messed it up a little bit. Oh my goodness. But, um, mm. so I got uh, uh, both ends of the spectrum there. It was, yeah. uh, we felt like it was pretty rewarding because uh, uh, United States Air Force in Europe then had about, let's see, about, mm, I guess, at least 10 to 12 wings mm -hmm. of fighter bombers that were uh, uh, all nuclear capable. And each one of these wings had three, generally three squadrons, and each squadron had four airplanes on the works. So mm -hmm. Quite a few fighters. And we uh, were targeted on tactical targets, uh, some of which were close enough to where we could fly low below the radar, mm -hmm. and some of which I, I got tasked for one during the Lebanon crisis, so it was basically a one way mission. Yeah. It was over in the far western portion of the Soviet Union, it's now Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I had been lucky enough not get shot down by MiGs and our, uh, well, they didn't have the SA-2s at the time, but mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't have had enough fuel to get back to yeah. Germany. Yeah. So what years were you in Germany or in Europe? Oh, that or was 1957 and uh, came home in 1961, but part of that yeah. time I spent down at Aviano as a flight safety officer. Basically. Okay. okay. Take me just sort of, you told me yesterday that you pretty much grew up on the a oh, campus, yeah. is that well, right? Well, uh, I have deep roots in this community. Right. Uh, for example, my mother uh, was a Wilcox, and uh, she grew up on the, my grandfather's accommodation farm ranch. They ran cattle and also mm -hmm. grew uh, crops and uh, cotton uh, about three miles this side of uh, Tabor. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father, I'm a fifth generation Texan, even mm -hmm. as old as I am. Really? Uh, my great great grandfather came over with the DeWitt colony uh -huh. in 1826. Uh -huh. But my father uh, was basically punching cattle until he came to Annam College in 1919, graduated in 1923. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, interesting thing, uh, let me show it to you. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm quite proud of it. All right. Uh, all it means very little. Except for me. <laughs> uh, ROTC branch at a and &M. Yes, sir. And my father was in this Air Service branch, and his summer camp between junior and senior year was down at Kelly and Brooks right. Air, Air, Air Base. Uh -huh. uh, Brooks Field. Uh -huh. Kelly Field. And uh, among other things, they, uh, this is this is he in a 90th squadron, the DICE, uh -huh. uh, which is still in existence as a fighter squadron, one of the oldest in the Air Force. Um, uh, that's a um, de Havilland DH-4. Uh -huh. Anyhow, um, among other things, they put him through, the, put all our ROTC cadets through the observer course, and he graduated as a uh, qualified observer in their, their service. Well, my dad uh, decided not to uh, stay in the Air Force and uh, wanted to come back and go to vet school. Uh -huh. Or he, he wanted, he was an uh, animal husband, but he had right. set, the high set on being a veterinarian. Uh -huh. uh, one of his classmates did stay in the Air Service, in the Air Corps, and the Air Force after that, and that was uh, General O.P. Wayland, mm -hmm. who retired as a four star general, matter of fact. Right. He was a classmate of my dad's. I see, I see. Anyway. Yeah, I read about him in, uh, in Henry Deathloff's book. Uh, Aggies go to war. I mm -hmm. read about him in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he met my mother, and uh, my mother was a school teacher at the time, and they, had, they got married. And my dad uh, uh, went through vet school uh, under doc, Dr. Mark Francis. Uh huh. And then Mark Francis asked him to come back and join the faculty. It was 1947. Mm -hmm. He'd been there ever since. And I was born in Bryan, 
And uh, after first grade, going through first grade, uh, Travis, uh, we moved out onto the campus. And our campus house was right across the street. It's where Jude Riley White is now, right mm -hmm. across the, uh, actually it was a gravel road and, and the fence to Kyle Field. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was back during the, the uh, oh, John Kimbrough days. Right, right. From uh, about mm, 1937, 1940. Uh -huh. In 1940, they moved uh, almost all of the faculty off the campus. Right. Except for the commandant, the vice, uh, uh, one of the vice presidents, DM In any case, we, my dad bought a house up in College Hills and I grew up there. I see. Graduated in 1952, and the was in. I because of my exposure in World War II, watching all those T6s fly around for Bryan Field and mm -hmm. other military airplanes. Uh, incidentally, my family went out in 1943 when the citizens of Brazos County had bought enough war bonds to purchase an F, a P-51. Mm -hmm. So, brand new P-51A flew in and demonstrated. Uh, never forgot that. But I, I wanted to be a pilot. But <laughs> now you graduated from 52 from A&M? From A&M. And, from a &M. And, a &M. and that was yeah. during the Korean War. And right. the Air Force uh, called me to active duty. Right. And I went into flying school. Uh, it took me a, a year to get a slot in flying school. I made a basically poor judgment because of some poor advice from you know, the slick wing uh, teach, uh, captains out at the NMROTC branch. Uh, he advised me not to apply for flying school until I got in the Air Force to see whether I liked it. And of course I loved it and uh, it just took a long time to get around to it. But by the time I got out of flying school, and incidentally, I went to uh, Orto, Florida for primary flew T sixes. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's where you started out. Wonderful airport. Right. Well, my first duty station was uh, Palm Beach International Airport. And I was um, a second lieutenant as in uh, what they then called air installations, now civil engineering. Mm -hmm. And uh, wonderful experience because I uh, got to see what the non flying Air Force is all about. And uh, about maybe two-thirds through my year there, uh, the captain, who was a captain, who was the uh, adjutant of the squadron, got ripped in the 1953 rip. And uh, there's a reduction in force mm -hmm. after the uh, Korean War was over. Mm -hmm. And so they made me a second lieutenant, the adjutant, and that was a wonderful experience, working with uh, the airmen. Mm -hmm. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. And, uh, had a great respect for the contribution of airmen in the Right, sense. right. Uh, sometimes pilots are so divorced from the enlisted population. They right. don't appreciate it. Sure. Anyway, I went through yeah. flying school and uh, you might say with flying colors and made, was high in my class and uh, the top half of the class, they don't do this anymore, the top half of the class went to jets, the bottom half of the class went to multi engines I see. And uh, I chose uh, uh, jets and had my choice of uh, bases, and I chose Brian. So I uh -huh. came back here and went through basic, through T-28 and T-33, graduated in 54. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I was top, or I wasn't top, I think I was number three in the class, but mm -hmm. top high enough to where I got my choice of F-86s. Mm -hmm. They were very... Uh, the most desirous of the assignments at the time. And I went down through, before I went to Nellis, I went through Laughlin at uh, Del Rio. They had just established a phase one gunnery course there in uh, what later they called the AT-33. It was just a T-30, dash one T-33, a couple of 50 calibers and gun sight. Went through all, qualified in all the uh, gunnery events. Mm -hmm. And uh, then went out to Nellis and flew 86 E's and F's. The difference, the E was the one that had the slats 
and the F had an uprated engine and had hard wing. Mm -hmm. That was a result of the Korean War experience, where mm -hmm. the uh, ease with the slats, when you got high altitude trying to chase the MiGs, and they get slow, and the slats would come out and kill her mock, and they'd stall out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they put a hard wing on it, and they got it to where the F would go up oh, close to 50,000 feet. It took a while to get up there. Yeah. But uh, it makes it go a little, still go a little higher. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, even when I was flying, it was, uh, it was the finest uh, fighter in the world. Yeah. Uh, certainly superior to MiG-15. Right. And then uh, after instructing at Williams, uh, which was a real treat, uh, I got this beautiful assignment to Germany mm -hmm. and a fighter day squadron. Right. 53rd, mm -hmm. and uh, oh, really, really like that. Uh, I, I have this kind of a fighter pilot personality where I like to test my ability against the uh, the odds. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, anyway, <laughs> uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Came back to the States to Air Training Command <clears throat> to Moody Air Force Base. Got into a uh, what they call uh, MAP pilot transfer, military assistance pack. We train military all assistance. military assistance pack. Uh, pack, okay. All our students were uh -huh. uh, funded by a military assistance pack. In other words, they were all mostly all foreigners. We did put some Americans through that were going to go to helicopter school. Mm -hmm. We trained uh, students from 26 nations, but to predominantly, and this was started back. Got in the squadron in '61. Predominantly, they were Vietnamese. Not trained. Oh, uh, over over 100 Vietnamese students. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a, even though we were flying the T-28, which wasn't a jet. Right. Uh, I had a, a great sense of accomplishment. Nobody out in those days. Nobody knew knew anything about Vietnam. Right. And we hadn't even sent the advisors so. I, uh, matter of fact, I went down and volunteered to go to uh, Eglin to be in that jungle gym program, which was a call sign for the uh, air commanders. Mm -hmm. uh, and I uh, found that I couldn't do that because my status was frozen because they had selected me for, for a, uh, uh, an air service school, Armed Forces Staff College. Mm -hmm. So I was in that squadron until about 67, went to Norfolk to Armed Forces Staff College, volunteered for Vietnam, gave me my choice between the F-4 and the 105, and uh, I, I wanted to go chase MiG, so I chose the F-4. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, powers that be and personnel sent me in country rather than to Yubon mm -hmm. or Yundorn over in Thailand. Mm -hmm. They were the ones that chased MiGs, and I was at Cam Ran Bay, oh, okay. which uh, uh, it, uh, I enjoyed that too. Were you still flying? I was flying the F4? F4, uh -huh. F4C. That the, that out of, was the out first model. Cameron Bay. Cameron Bay. Okay. 559 Attack Fighter Squad. Uh -huh. And uh, that was the first model that the Air Force uh, built. Uh, of course, the F4 was a Navy airplane. Right. And uh, uh, the Air Force thought enough, or McNamara thought enough of it to wait. He forced it down the throat of the Air Force, and the Air Force didn't like that, but they actually found out they had a pretty good airplane. I think. So this was called the Phantom II? The Phantom II. Okay. F-4 is the Phantom. Yes. The Phantom yes. Okay. And uh, so I, I threw about, oh, two-thirds, three-fourths of a tour at Cameron Bay, and then uh, my squadron commander called me in. and. Uh, told me they needed a silver-tongued individual to go down to Tom Sanute to be briefing officer for General Brown, the commanding general. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, do I have a choice? And he said, no. And I said, okay, sir, I'll All go. Right. All right. <laughs> that was, uh, it, it, uh, uh, that was a, a good assignment. I, uh, General Brown didn't like to get briefed on Sunday, mm -hmm. so I had 24 hours after Saturday briefing until I had to start the, another briefing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would go over to uh, 
go to any squadron I, I could find that had an open seat to ever fly. Mm -hmm. And at Benoit was a fighter base about, I guess, 20, 25 kilometers, 15 miles or so from, from uh, Saigon. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of these friends I had in the, in the VNAF, the Vietnamese Air Force, there were probably two dozen or a dozen or two of no, must have been about a dozen people in that squadron that I knew, from the squadron commander to the flight commanders and others. Yeah, and people they, that you had that trained. Made fly right? the F-5. People there. that you had trained? The, yes. From the Vietnamese Air Force, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And they let me fly the uh, F-5. And I flew about 19 combat sorties with them. Yeah. And um, also, from nostalgia, I... Uh, Went down and flew the back seat of, and oh, half a dozen sorties in the F 100F. Mm -hmm. I'd flown the 100. And uh, heck, I'd go fly with anybody anywhere that had a had an open cockpit. I even uh, I even flew with a uh, a spooky crew one night, the uh, AC 47. Uh huh. It's called a spooky. Spooky crew? Well, that was the call sign. Spooky. Yeah. It, it was a gunship, uh -huh. the C-47, that okay. had three mini-guns uh -huh. uh, pointing out the side on the left-hand side. Right. And the pilot had a sight uh, next to him, and he could aim the guns by maneuvering the yeah. C-47. Yeah. It was the first of uh, several models of gunships. Then uh -huh. they had a C AC-119 and an right. AC-130. Yeah. And it is, the AC-130s are still current in the Air Force right? and in Special Forces at Herbert. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed my combat tour over in Vietnam. And, uh, Tell me more about it. Tell me about, uh, you, you, were, you were a fighter pilot. You, yes. Your job every day was and, to... Uh, um, I'd fly on average every, two out of every three days, mm -hmm. simply because we had uh, Probably had more airplanes and fewer sorties than we had pilots in the squadron, and so didn't get didn't get to fly every day. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, a seven day week, uh, except for the uh, uh, R and R, and most of us got a mini R and R. No, well, there's two weeks out of out of country with for the with the year, mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, Actually, I had been a flying safety officer down at Aviano at, uh, in Germany, flying 100s and T-33, mm -hmm. and uh, so I had a good appreciation of accident rates. And so when I got to Cameron Bay, I got thumbing through some of their uh, the loss rates to combat, the loss rates to operational accidents. And I figured I was uh, in no more jeopardy than when I was flying F-100s. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> but that 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 wasn't a concern of mine. I, I I've, I've always been fearless, and it's never never bothered me. Um, a lot of people say you know I'm always scared in combat, but uh, anyway. Um, it, uh, one thing, if we get a chance to mention it, okay. I would kind of like to mention, uh, in memorial, mm -hmm. my backseater that I trained with, and Dave Smonthen, and he's my backseater, and, uh, Cameron Bay, mm -hmm. didn't make it back. Mm -hmm. he what was and, his name? Uh, Tom Burge. Tom Burge? Fine young man. Mm -hmm. And, um, he, um. I was flying with, uh, uh, this was not too long after I left Cameron Bay to go to uh, Tonsonu. And I had been the flight commander, and my assistant flight commander then moved up, took over my job as flight commander. And since Tom Birds was the best gib or guy in the back, mm -hmm. backseater in the flight, he took over my gib. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and uh, they were they were killed on a, a night uh, scramble. Um, as an aside, uh, a couple of people asked me what, what was the most terrifying event I had, blind yeah. fighters or, or actually. Yeah. I was about to ask that. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> uh, curiously enough, my most terrifying event was not in combat. It was flying the F-4, mm -hmm. but I, uh, for about mm, four weeks, five weeks, something like that, I went up to... Uh, Tegu, Korea, one of the squadrons in the 12th uh, wing, uh, their camera had been deployed up there as air defense for uh, after the North Koreans hijacked the Pueblo. Mm -hmm. you recall that? Right, sure. We were at Tegu and uh, we sat alert with uh, F-4Cs and we had uh, four Barrel missiles, four Sidewinder missiles, and a gun pod. And the gun pod was a big, long, 1,100-pound pod that had the, the Gatling gun and 1,100 rounds of mm -hmm. ammunition. And we had some interesting uh, scrambles. I had two scrambles in one day. Both, both we went out and scrambled. Uh, or we uh, intercepted a Russian Badger uh, in, Intel aircraft or mm -hmm. uh, intelligence gathering airplane. Mm -hmm. Elit is what they call. But back to my uh, most terrifying mission. Uh, uh, one night we were on alert at about 3 a.m. They scrambled us and I did not wake up. I was not conscious of anything until I was passing through 5,000 feet. Wow. I do not remember the klaxon going off. I do not remember running out to the airplane, getting in, me starting the airplane, the backseater making the radio calls and doing his thing, taxiing out. And I was a flight leader and I was the led the, the other flight. And I was just in an alpha state. It's just like highway hypnosis. Mm -hmm. I was doing everything by rope. Unfortunately, he did everything right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that, when I woke up and considered that, that would terrify me. Sure. Were you sleep deprived? Was that it? I mean, were you Well, just no, sleep? no, no. Um, I wasn't sleep deprived. Yeah. I always got adequate sleep. Yeah. It's just that when you wake up or, or alert out of a dead sleep at uh -huh. 3 a.m., right. it's. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I had been okay. scrambled the night before and uh -huh. not had that. I'd, I'd been awake. Right. That one, that, that one kind of got to me. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. What about terrifying, actually, combat events? I mean, no. Uh, in South Vietnam, we uh, we would go up to Quezon there with the Quezon battle was going on, mm -hmm. and they were shooting at us. But uh, in South Vietnam, they had so little. Uh, the NVA and the VC uh, had so little armament of any uh, anything good that uh, mm -hmm. uh, it was a big deal when the Ford Air Controller found a 50 caliber shooting, mm -hmm. and he would call in all the attack air he could get and wipe out that little 50 caliber machine guns. Right, right. And uh, uh, I guess uh, I got. Uh, I guess one of my one of my memorable missions in uh, in Vietnam um, was when the Quezon battle was uh, going on. It wasn't the height of the Quezon battle. It's toward the end there. It's after Tet hit. Mm -hmm. I think this was in April mm -hmm. of '68, and they called us all in for briefing, and they said, "Well, we're going to go up and carry maximum load to Quezon." And uh, normally we carried uh, about uh, six 750-pound bombs, three on each uh, intermediate station on the wing, mm -hmm. and about uh, a couple of fuel tanks. And in this case, we had uh, six uh, bombs 
on what he called the MERV. That was a multiple eject, uh, no, tur, tri triple ejection racks. It carried mm -hmm. three 750-pound bombs under each wing. And they had a MERV, or a multiple ejector rack, underneath the uh, underneath the center mm -hmm. of the fuselage, and it would carry three and three, or six. So it was 12 750-pound bombs. So they came in for a briefing and said, well, guys, uh, uh, we're going to carry 12 750 pound bombs. The only problem is it uh, makes the center of gravity a little bit too far forward mm -hmm. and the airplane won't take off normally. And uh, he said, see, because a, a little quirk in the F-4 is unlike any other airplane I ever flew. Mm -hmm. Maybe there are other airplanes that do the same thing, but uh, except for that mission, every takeoff I ever made in the F-4, you start the takeoff row of the stick right back as far as it'll go, right mm -hmm. uh, against the seat. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the power in both engine and afterburner, when the airplane gets to nose lift off, <coughs> nose comes up, just flies off beautifully as yeah. can. And uh, in this case, it said, well, uh, nose wheel won't lift off. It says, here's what you have to do. Uh, leave the stick in neutral, and that will mean that the horizontal stabilizer, in, in, instead of being up like this, mm -hmm. would be neutral, and therefore less drag. And so, when you get up to, a, I believe, I think it was 153 knots, take the stick and bang it against the instrument panel, and right back in the gut, and leave it there. So that will depress the nose gear strut, and then the uh, reaction will put it back up to the right angle of attack, and it'll take off. I was uh, <laughs> thought to ourselves, yes, sir, if you say so, Colonel, we'll do it. You mean dip down and then go up? Huh? <laughs> and uh, if I got it, it worked. And every airplane got off. So just a little, little bounce. And uh, we... Uh, it was such a heavy load that we had to go on a tanker, and in case on was so far away, uh -huh. we had to go on a tanker and uh, refuel. And we got up to case on, and the reason for this semi panic was that the North Vietnamese moved moved some cannons in on the reverse slope of the mountain that's just to the northeast, about uh, six or eight miles or so mm -hmm. from. Airstrip, Marine Airstrip, Marine Base. And uh, not only were they shooting up over um, at, at, the, at Quezon Base, but they were also shooting at airplanes in the sky. Uh -huh. And it was so smoky and explosions down there, it's hard to tell. And uh, they put us in a holding pattern. We were a fifth up, stacked up in a holding pattern, waiting for the fact everybody else to drop their armament and we'd get down. And, and they had told us that, uh, and the fact told us also, he said, uh, uh, guys are shooting at you down there, and so uh, ripple off your entire load in one pass, mm -hmm. meaning you put it on a ripple, which would have a, a, a slight sequence between each bomb, so mm -hmm. it would heat, hit each other going down. Right. And, and it dropped 12 of these 750 found bombs and wow. <laughs> pulled out <laughs> and uh, then we were a little Scotia on fuel getting back and uh, we took advantage, we didn't take advantage, we used the facility the Navy, uh, the Marines had at Chu Lai mm -hmm. uh, and Chu Lai had a conventional runway and it had originally started out as a SATS base, it's a Marine experiment they had, mm -hmm. it's a great idea. They had an arresting gear to stop the airplane, and then they had a catapult that would catapult them all. Mm -hmm. and they had a very short runway, but uh, as the war progressed, they went in there, uh, round and route, went in there and made a concrete runway. But the neat thing about it is, the Marines would let us hot refuel. We and they did their own airplanes. So we move into the refueling pit, shut down the left engine, and they would uh, put mm -hmm. their single point refueling right. um, and refuel the airplane so as a refuel we'd start the engine again, just go right out, yeah. take off and go back to Cameron Bay. Yeah. 
And the Air Force uh, was pretty s stuffy about it. You, you landed at Da Nang, the mm -hmm. Air Force Base, and it'd make you shut down, and everybody had to go in operation. You had to file another flight plan, and all yeah. this. It took a lot more time. Right. So it was pretty Yeah, we, uh, we liked Marines. Uh, yeah, I'll I've always liked good. Marines. Right. I, I like <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> we. Uh, and then had several night missions that were exciting. Yeah. <laughs> I was on a, on a dive bomb run and just about to pick a off and the flare went out. Oh. <laughs> it was dark. And so I figured I had a pretty good solution. I just pickled off the bomb and pulled out and by the time another flare came out. But it was uh, It was interesting. And we had some troops in contact missions that were very, I thought, very rewarding. Uh -huh. And uh, whenever we'd go out on the org pad on on those, we would normally be loaded with loaded with uh, what I guess this is a this is a Marine or a Navy uh, terminology, and we picked it up too. We called it snake and nape. Mm -hmm. Snake was what they called high drag bombs. And we'd have 750-pound bombs, and uh, you would release them at low altitude. Uh, and if you didn't have this retarding device, they'd blow up and blow your airplane out of the air. Mm -hmm. And these uh, steel, uh, it's still like an umbrella, would pop open and uh, retard the bomb enough so you had clearance before the bomb hit the ground. The Slow down the bomb. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, nape was, of course, napalm, and we loved dropping napalm because mm -hmm. that was so effective, you know, particularly in troops in contact situations. Right. And then one of the airplanes would have CBUs, which are uh, cluster bomb units. Have you ever seen or heard of cluster bomb units? Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me yeah. show you one. I've okay. Got a, I've got a inert cluster bomb unit. This is blue, that means it's inert. But right. this is what they look like. Oh, okay. And they're aluminum and they have uh, steel uh, pellets embedded in there. Right. And the charge. And those fins rotate it after it goes out of the tube. Uh -huh. and you drop it. And then it uh, arms itself after it rotates so many times, like, right. a, like a real bomb. Right. Wow. That could cause some damage. <laughs> yeah. It's just like hand grenades, a whole bunch of them. Right. Another mission that involved these that I went on uh, at Cameron Bay, the Armament Center for Meglin brought some uh, what they call fuel air munitions, mm -hmm. um, commonly called propane bombs. Right. These darn things are really strange looking. They look like a regular uh, propane tank, about this big around, about 15 feet long, and they just had a conical uh, steel uh, nose welded on. In the back, they did have some uh, 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 fins, and somewhere back there, they would put a uh, phosphorus grenade mm -hmm. uh, fuse to the proper interval that they wanted. Well, uh, they wanted to try these out. And uh, somebody came up with the concept, well, I thought a pretty sound concept, um, up near Kuchi, which is so hmm, roughly north of uh, Saigon. Mm -hmm. uh, the VC had a uh, tremendous underground complex, mm -hmm. tunnels, spider holes, and everything. So the theory was, I went out with the uh, initial flight. Uh, about 30 minutes before the fuel and air munitions, and we dropped CBUs, dropped these. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them were instantaneous, and some of them were fused to cook off within a half hour, 45 mm -hmm. minutes. And uh, presumably this would cause the uh, uh, BC and NVA, whoever was in there, both of them, mm -hmm. to go underground. Mm -hmm. And then they came along with the fuel air munitions dropped and this propane would seep down into the tunnels and then go off. 
and they showed us some movies, and it was really impressive. They go, whoop! And it didn't sound like an explosion, just whoop! Mm -hmm. And uh, they told us that uh, the overpressure was the greatest, uh, was greater than any weapon we had in our inventory, except nuclear weapons. Wow. Now, I didn't have well, anywhere near as much as, uh, overpressure as nuclear weapons, but uh, certainly more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> uh, we wanted some feedback on it after, we, after they went out and dropped those. And uh, uh, the Army declined to go down to the tunnels and find out. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Uh, I think we still have some fuel air munitions in the inventories. So, right. But, uh, right. In fact, I was, uh, see, a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, there at Gaglin Army Museum and uh, uh -huh. took some pictures of, of them. And, uh, was talking, I was trying to talk to the curator, but he was briefing some group of kids that I've yeah. always been interested in. Right. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've always been interested in, in uh, the armament that we dropped off of it. So. Sure. Yeah. Another thing uh, yeah. I might, I forgot to talk about. Mm -hmm. Now, um, um, flew all these fighters, and curious enough, my favorite by far is that F-86 Sabre. Mm -hmm. That is such a beautiful airplane to fly, and such an easy airplane to fly that the controls are so finely balanced that you could fly that with a stick, mm -hmm. with just two fingers. Right. And. Uh, it's easy to easy to fly formation with, and uh, had a few emergencies uh, problems. Had a uh, in-flight fire, which uh, sounds worse than it was. Uh, it was an electrical fire, electrical wire. It basically, filled up the cockpit with uh, this acrid smoke uh, uh, from wires, mm -hmm. insulation burning off. So I just went by the tech checklist, turned off all of the electrical system, mm -hmm. and uh, it uh, cut off the source of the fire. F-86 has a canopy that slides back on rails. Right. And so cockpit was full of smoke. I just opened the canopy, <laughs> got all the smoke out of there, and I was within sight of Williams Air Force Base anyway. I just yeah. came down. and. Uh, so you were, you were flying fairly low at the time? So. Oh, I, I, no, I was returning from a mission. I see. And I just uh, came down. And, yeah. Um, had a wingman who figured out what was going on. Stu, uh, and, uh, he figured what was going on. We were on initial, and I rocked my wings, which is the signal for no radio. Right. And, uh, it, there was no problem. I had a lot of emergencies. Pretty sure it's an emergency. I figured I'd save a couple airplanes for Air Force but in the 100. But uh, the point I was going to make, I got to the F-4, uh -huh. and I have flown almost a thousand hours in, in most of the models of the F-4, the 4C and D and E. I never, never had a single emergency in that airplane. It was so reliable. And uh, uh, from what I've read, F-16. F-15 and F-22 are also uh, even more reliable than the F-4. Mm -hmm. And uh, the accident rate, which I mentioned was probably 30, 35 accidents per 100,000 flying hours in the F-100. Mm -hmm. Accident rate for fighters is now down around maybe one and a half or two accidents per 100,000 flying hours. Wow. The improvement is remarkable. Yeah. Because the engines are more reliable, the airframe and systems are more reliable. Right. You don't get lost as often. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, after Vietnam, um, I went over to back over to Europe. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I got to take my family over there both times. Mm -hmm. uh, went to Ramstein to 17th Air Force headquarters, and where I was initially chief of flight safety. Mm -hmm and um, then director of safety for 17th until um, they chucked the headquarters back and we're going to move 17th Air Force over to Simbach Air Base, which is about 
15 kilometers away and mm -hmm. uh, 10 miles away. And uh, I, uh, another guy had come in that outranked me, took over the job as director of safety. Mm -hmm. I went out to Spangdalem and we started up a new wing there, 52nd TIE Fighter Wing, which is still in existence over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I established a safety program for the wing. And um, this was in, in Germany? In Germany. Yeah. And I had, while I was at Ramstein, I'd been flying the F 4E. Mm -hmm. And uh, then in the uh, 52nd wing, I was flying the F 4D. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was so fortunate. From the day I got into flying school until maybe a month, uh, not today, a couple of days after I got to Bartow, uh, until about a month before or less before I retired, um, I was actively flying. Mm -hmm. And I went to a couple of service schools, uh, Air Force uh, uh, Squadron Officer School, but we were all assigned to an airplane, of course. <laughs> Didn't much care for the airplane. I was a sign plane. I was flying the C-45, a little twin-engine beach. Mm -hmm. And in Armed Forces Staff College, uh, I wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't allowed to fly. I just wasn't assigned anywhere to fly. Mm -hmm. But my uh, seminar leader had a deal worked out where he got his proficiency time with the Navy and Navy T-28s. Mm -hmm. And I'd flown a lot of time with T-28s, but I had flown some Navy T-28s. And uh, we'd go over there about a perfect week and a half for a couple of weeks and fly Navy airplanes. Mm -hmm. And that was fun too. Yeah. Uh, but I... Uh, when did you retire? I retired in 1973. Mm -hmm. And... Um, where were you still... In Europe, or well, or? I was at Spangdahl, and the Air Force came out with a policy uh, right there in the last little bit uh, that uh, quote unquote uh, didn't have to fly anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I could draw flying pay, but I didn't have to fly proficiency. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody had been flying for twenty years. And I went to my wing commander. I was the wing director of safety, and I was supposed to fly the mission airplane. I was flying the F-4D. And he said, oh, no, you got a major work for you. He's flying the F-4D. You don't need to fly it. So I had about made the decision anyway, but I, that's, that sealed the decision for me to retire when I got back to the, the port at uh, McGuire. Mm -hmm. um, I just, <laughs> frankly, um, my sole motivation in the Air Force was flying, and uh, I didn't fly fighters the entire time. I was in training command for a while, but um, that was my motivation. Mm -hmm. And I just could not see going back and sitting at some desk doing something, whatever, right. and watching other people fly. Yeah. So I, I retired with a total of 21 years, 20 of them fly, mm -hmm. and I uh, logged uh, close to, but not quite. 5,000 hours in Air Force flying time, uh -huh. which uh, loved every minute of it. Sure. sure. Then I came back to uh, a and uh -huh. and uh, I had uh, earned, studied for, and earned a master's degree in systems management from the University of Southern California while I was in the Air Force. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, got a job with the Executive Development Programs Office at A&M and College of Business. Mm -hmm. Taught management a little bit. They were uh, uh, they were desperate for people to teach management. And mm -hmm. I was qualified to do so. And uh, uh, maybe we might not mention this, but after mm -hmm. about eight years, I got fed up to hear with what I considered to be office politics. Mm -hmm. I now look back and realize what that was, was the encroaching political correctness, but nobody had named it by that, mm -hmm. at that time. And I had a, some other disagreement with uh, the dean of the College of Business, and the dean had come in, and he was trained, changing a lot of the aspects of the executive uh, development program. So I uh, uh, 
I resigned, but I was able to retire when mm -hmm. I reached a couple of years, a couple of three years later when I was mm -hmm. 55 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> worked about three years for EF Hutton, which was great. I uh, mm -hmm. learned a lot about investing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, my wife and I have always been savers and investors. And, right. Uh, we, uh, uh, with the retired pay and what we've invested, we're, yeah. uh, we're not hurting. Yeah. Good. Good. And uh, we're not rich, but we're not hurt. <laughs> Tell me about your, your, your family. When did you and, and uh, Ann, is that right? Ann when and you, I uh, met uh, in Stephen F. Austin High School in Bryan. Uh -huh. uh, a good many of the professors at A&M, uh, I went to Consolidated up through freshman and Consolidated. Uh -huh. And we had just about as many people in the entire consolidated high school as they had in, in one uh, in the class of 48 at Brian Stephen F. Austin. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a few more, but about the same. And um, uh, Stephen F. Austin had a, a much greater reputation mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so most, uh, a lot of professors uh, and other people at the college station sent kids in Brian. So I went in sophomore in high school and I met and started going together and, uh -huh. and then she went <laughs> her parents sent up for a TC, TSCW and told her to stay up there and she got, got, got a degree. Uh -huh. <laughs> that wasn't exactly true. But, uh, well, she got a want, degree. They didn't want us to get married. Yeah, they didn't want us to get married. <laughs> they didn't want anything in between. <laughs> anyway, we, uh, she graduated in three and a half years from TSCW and came back and they allowed us to uh, to get married about six weeks before I graduated in 1952. Uh -huh. Easter. I and, see. Uh, then uh, when I graduated, I just sat around for about three year, three months, up for three months, waiting to go into the Air Force. And, uh, so you got married right before you graduated from mm -hmm. from A and M. I see. <coughs> we. Uh, uh -huh. He wasn't uh, old enough. He wasn't 21 when he graduated from A and M. I see. Couldn't take him into the service. I see. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I uh, yeah, yeah, I, I had to be 21, and I yeah. I graduated at uh, 20. Uh huh. Um, you're probably familiar with this, but uh, it wasn't until about 1940. Uh, no, a little later than that. That uh, Texas went to a 12-year school system, mm -hmm. and I got in early enough. Right. So Ann and I graduated with 11 years. Mm -hmm. I. Uh, Skipped the fifth grade, mm -hmm. and that was great because everybody said fifth grade was really hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, we uh, we've been together a long time. Yeah. So you have family? And yeah, had two boys. Uh -huh. uh, our oldest um, was uh, in a uh, the electronics design program at the engineering. Extension uh, service mm -hmm. used to run out at the annex. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know whether you're familiar with it or not, but mm -hmm. uh, this program uh, predated uh, PCs. And a lot of these graduates went to work yeah. designing circuits for uh, right. computers. Right. Well, Glenn, uh, he's right, right ready to graduate, and mm -hmm. uh, was killed in a head-on collision. Oh my goodness! Coming. Back from the right annex. Right the entrance to Brian Field. Back annex, six. Right there. And our youngest son, um, at the time, wanted to uh, take foreign affairs or something like that. And uh, he told me that uh, they had good programs at TU and Cougar High, mm -hmm. USC, and Tulane. <laughs> and I told him, I said, well, Fred, you can't afford to go to TU or Cougar High. You knew what I was talking about. Uh huh. And I said, I got a master's degree from USC. You go out there if you want. He chose Tulane. Mm -hmm. And then he went through uh, uh, law school. I see. And he has been. At the University of Texas. Okay. <coughs> well, I don't. Well, if he'd have gone through <laughs> Tulane Law School, he would have been practicing Napoleonic <laughs> Law. <laughs> Napoleonic I law. was not going to have any Napoleonic Law. <laughs> 
I like Spanish law much well, better. Well, I, I must agree. If you're going to be a lawyer at Texas, you need to go through the TU Law School. Yeah. <laughs> He's been a um, uh, assistant district attorney in Dallas now for about 18, 19 years. Okay. And, uh, What's his name? Fred. Fred, Fred, Fred Burns. Burns. Uh-huh. Uh, they have any kids? No. Okay. Uh, his wife is a feminist. I see. She is a product. She is a tea sipper. I see. Her father's on the faculty. I see. I see. I mean, tea sipper yeah. with a capital T and a bright orange. <laughs> <laughs> but her brother and her sister-in-law are Aggies. I see. Okay. Well, good. There. <laughs> so he's a, he's a, a assistant DA in Dallas. Yeah, he's been okay. Criminal prosecutor. I see. He ran for judge, but didn't make it this last time. I see. I think uh, the district attorney, the, the new district attorney that selected uh, last election, uh, is a good friend of his. Uh -huh. and, uh, I suspect that when a court becomes available, he'll get a point or two. He's I already see. been vetted for judge. Right. So he's he's next in, or should be next in line. For and he's, re he's a Republican, so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so good shot. He got beaten out uh, for the judge by a uh, uh, black uh, female. I see. Anyway, um, we were very proud of him. One other thing uh, that I didn't mention along the way because it didn't involve flack. Uh -huh. uh, Oh, back there in the late 50s, late 60s, I'd have to go out to the uh, range every year and requalify with a 45 because I was a combat fire pilot. Mm -hmm. It hurt my pride that I had trouble qualifying with a 45. Uh -huh. I got a, a cold gun collection of cold automatics here. Right. But I just had trouble shooting the 45. And about 1963, uh, we'd moved the squadron from Moody over to Randolph, and I had a guy in the uh, squadron who was on the Randolph pistol team. And, uh -huh. uh, I was telling him my tale of woe, and he said, Oh, I, I teach you how to shoot 45 in two hours. Right. Uh, hey, that's going to be a trick. I'm going to let you do that. Uh -huh. And uh, he used a, uh, uh, a very well accurized uh, uh, competition mm -hmm. 45, mm -hmm. and instead of using that hardball, 230 grain bullet, 45 arm ammunition, uh, used 180 grain behind uh, about a half a load it was for uh, competition shoot. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, apparently recognized that I had talent, mm -hmm. raw talent, and I always liked to shoot pistols, right. but I never did any competition. Yeah. And so uh, he asked me to join the pistol team, and I was on a couple of different Air Force pistol teams until I went to Vietnam and didn't shoot any over there. Right. Except uh, 20 millimeter. Uh -huh. And um, then subsequently to Europe, I didn't shoot anymore. We got back, it was kind of over the hill as a competitor. But I pretty well knew my trade. Mm -hmm. I knew how to shoot well. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I voluntarily went over to uh, Trigon to volunteer my services as an assistant coach for the pistol team. Found out they had allowed it to lapse. Mm -hmm. They didn't have one. Mm -hmm. So uh, I uh, I formed one. Uh, I got the uh, cooperation of a, an army captain at Dulles mm -hmm. We started the anti pistol team up again in 1974. I see. And coaching it ever since. Primarily because you can't find anybody to take it over from me. Yeah. <laughs> but I love it, I tell you. So I, uh, I, get, uh, I get more satisfied, I get as much satisfaction out of coaching as yeah. I did out of shooting. Yeah. How many are on the team? Oh, we've got, uh, I basically coach two teams. One uh -huh. is a university team, and I got about 12 people on that. I think four or five girls, uh, mm -hmm. 13 or 14, something like that. And then I, I coach the ROTC pistol. Mm -hmm. And we've got about 10 or 12 on that. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd say 10, 12. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on who comes. Yeah. <laughs> but um, two years ago, 
Um, my ROTC pistol team I coached. You should call them high. But I coached. Mm -hmm. uh, won the uh, NRA National Collegiate Pistol ROTC Championship. I remember that. I remember that. And yeah. uh, we generated quite a lot of uh, positive recognition in uh -huh. the, uh, the Trigon. And so I think it's led to a situation that will perpetuate the pistol team. Right. They, uh, they, last year, uh, one of the team members used his own initiative, and, um, wonderful leadership and, and perseverance and negotiating skill. He persuaded the powers that be in Trigon to create ROTC pistol team as an ROTC sponsored unit, mm -hmm. uh, similar to um, the orienteering team and the fish drill team and the RVs. They're all units. Right. They have a commander. Right. And that's the way it is with the pistol team. With the ROTC pistol team. Mm -hmm. Last year came in second again, but uh, uh -huh. we had come in second and won it. Came in second. And this year, I'm, I'm hoping we'll be able to beat out our uh, Ohio State. Win it again. Right. So how many times next year will be? Is there, is there just that main competition, or are there other competitions leading oh, up? Oh, we to have the a number of competitions. For uh -huh. example, we're having a, uh, a big match. Uh, I say big match, moderate size match in November, mm -hmm. and our chief competitors uh, are the team from. Uh, uh, what's now Missouri State University it used to be Southwest Missouri mm -hmm. State right. at uh, Springfield, Missouri. Right. And in December we will go up there and have a match with them. I see. And then we'll have uh, a match to go to over at TU in January. Yeah. And we'll host a uh, uh, NRA sectional here in February. Right. That's one where we post a score that we. Uh, hope to qualify for the Nationals. Mm -hmm. Now, they've had the Nationals 26 years, and our team, it takes, you got to be in the top 10 teams in the nation to be invited. Mm -hmm. And we've been invited and gone 24, 24 years out of 26. Yeah. So, Pretty successful. Yeah. Well, it's typical because I don't have any scholarships. Right. I have uh, let's say minimal support. Um, for example, we'd, we'd like to have more money for travel, mm -hmm. but uh, we do. I have uh, <clears throat> put in a number of grants that I have received uh, mm -hmm. excellent support from the NRA Foundation to buy state-of-the-art competition pistols. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it's it's tough uh, competing with the uh, military academies particularly uh, Naval Academy and, and uh, West Point, mm -hmm. and to some extent also Coast Guard Academy. Mm -hmm. Air Force Academy uh, doesn't, uh, they have a team, but uh, they haven't, we, we have a better team. Than they do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but we have come in, uh, I believe, once in those years, third. Right. That's the best we've done. Yeah, and our university team. Yeah. yeah. Is this you? Yes, it is. I like the, like the stash. Well, uh, <laughs> some fighter pilots uh, do wear mustaches, and uh, um, I guess they tolerated me. They, uh, they didn't really know what to do with the squadron. But the funny thing, um, He's either the chief of staff or the uh, PACAF commander. I'm not sure, but it was General John Ryan who he called him uh, Three Fingers Ryan because he got two fingers shut off in the B-17 <laughs> in World War II. Uh -huh. He was the strategic air command right. type, and he did not like mustaches. Uh -huh. So he was coming to Cameron Bay. Yeah. And my squadron commander said, Burns, you go up the tower and stay up the tower the entire time that Ryan's here. <laughs> and they knew darn well that General Ryan wasn't going to climb all those stairs to go up to the tower, so <laughs> they wouldn't see me. Uh, 
So where was this taken? Was this taken in Cameron Bay, or was that, that uh, let's getting see. into a uh, This was during the time I was up in, uh, in the 558th at uh, Tegu. Uh -huh. And uh, this was uh, this was the Cameron Bay. You see some of the bombs and the missiles over here. And I, I've got a uh, survival vest on. You can't see it, but I've got a I got a 45 slung on my right hip there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Is this a, a Phantom II? That, that's that's a four Phantom, right? Yeah. Wow. Anyway, uh, I think I've had a wonderful experience. Um, and uh, wonderful life. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, really, of, really uh, fascinating. Uh, a lot of it was very rewarding. Yeah. Uh, not so much in monetarily or getting promoted to high rank. Uh, when you retired from the Air Force, what, what rank were you? I was a major. Major? Mm -hmm. uh, we won't need to go into this, but uh, mm -hmm. back when I was the first lieutenant, they caught me buzzing. They caught you buzzing? I got caught buzzing. Oh, okay. And they gave me an Article 15. It's supposed to be death for an officer. But, uh, and I rather not. <laughs> I'm not ashamed of it. I don't mind to tell it, but I don't want to put it on the, yeah. on the air. But no, in think. any case, um, the wing commander at the time was uh, Colonel George S. Brown. Uh -huh. and later, it was a four star general. As a matter of fact, he was a guy I briefed in, mm -hmm. in Vietnam, and he went on to be. Chief of Staff of the Air Force, the Chief of the Joint Chiefs. And, uh, but he was an old bomber. Mm -hmm. And he didn't tolerate uh, fighter pilots acting like fighter pilots. Again. <laughs> and so, uh, standing up in front of him, getting my Article 15, he said, Well, Lieutenant said, You probably will never make captain. It kind of froze my brain. I don't remember a thing he said after that. But yeah. uh, I decided I was just going to stay on it as long as he would let me fly. Well, contrary to what he predicted, I made captain on time, uh -huh. major on time. I went to squadron officer school. Not everybody gets selected for that. Something's going to have to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I was pretty good at my trade. Yeah. Not the best, pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. Uh, we all say we're the world's greatest fighter pilot. Uh -huh. but, uh, you know, uh, oh, there, there are those who are better. Right. Uh, and then I went to Armed Forces Staff College, which is an inter intermediate uh, uh -huh. staff college. And, uh, pretty high, highly prestigious. Right. right. And uh, volunteered for Vietnam and uh, just failed to make uh, Lieutenant Colonel. I think they drugged up. I don't know. <laughs> the old buzzing? <laughs> that didn't make any difference to me because um, I pretty well knew if I got promoted to Lieutenant Colonel, my flying days were going to Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, my motivation was fine. Right. So uh, that's, that's what you wanted to do. That's what I want to do, and that's what I got to do. Well, great. Um, well, good. We're gonna we're gonna do this. Uh, we're gonna tape this show tomorrow at one thirty, over near where you used to live over there at KAMU TV. You know where the TV station is there off the Houston Street. Across from the abortion clinic. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Is that, is that what was there? <laughs> okay. uh, well, no. Yeah. Uh, now, wait a minute. Uh, are you talking KMU's one on campus? Right, on campus. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, not KBTS. KMUC. No, no, okay. no, no, no. Okay. not KBTS. That's right, right. Over there. it is KMU yeah. because I finally Yeah, on campus. Right. On Dish Network right. uh, with the oh, okay. HD. Uh-huh. Uh, there's... They have three channels. Oh, is that right? Yeah. And it's yeah. the middle one, uh, 12 yeah. 02. Right, right. Uh, I right. finally found on your cable at Channel 4. I, yeah. I was able to take it uh, when yeah. you had Terry Ross on. Right, last weekend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, KMU is right there on yeah, the I know where it is. Houston Street. They're right across from the former students. I know where building. it is. Matter of fact, one story when Ann and there. I uh, married, mm -hmm. uh, we got uh, some of the old uh, uh, veterans and married housing. Mm -hmm. They used to have housing there across the street. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I don't know, for a bunch of uh, buildings that they had brought up from uh, Foster Field mm -hmm. in uh, um, Victoria when it closed down after right. the war. Right. 
and I remember we got a we had an apartment in there, two bedroom apartment for thirty dollars a month, which yeah. that was just about my uh, ROTC pay. Uh huh. <clears throat> so yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, I live right over there. Yeah. Well, that'll be uh, that'll we'll do it at uh, at one thirty. If you could be there around what would you like for me to wear? One twenty. Anything that you that you wish. I always wear a coat and tie, but my guests normally don't. So anything that they you're comfortable don't? in, yeah, okay. normally they don't. I, I, I was noticing Terry. I thought right. that was a neat. Yeah, he wore, that he he's the only person so far that's worn his uniform. Well, worn, uh, worn I don't uniform. have one that will fit. Right. Well, yeah, he didn't. Yeah. He didn't either. He said he bought that just a couple of years ago for a yeah. something that his son was doing. Yeah, he was telling about right. Right, but he's the only one so far that, that's worn a uniform. Normally, we don't do that. So anything that you're comfortable in, you know, so like what you're wearing now is just fine. That's uh, uh, or whatever you want to do, that's fine. If I can uh, take these two pictures with me and scan yeah, them, and I'll give sure them back can. to you on Wednesday. You sure can. Uh, uh, see if there are any more. You got over anything there. else? Uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know what I have. Something I have over here. Uh, nothing, nothing more than that. From your uh, here's some. Uh, Here's a picture it took a few years ago mm -hmm. when I was 60 years old. That's my son, daughter-in-law, mm -hmm. Ann and I. Oh, good. Yeah. You mind if I borrow this and do it so we'll just oh, have sure. the family? You That'll might. be good. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's yeah. a good picture. We're all 10, 15 <laughs> years younger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take that. Well, it, I'll, oh, look, I'll, at the, look at the pistol yeah, collection um, that you have. See, there. I have this collection of... Uh, this is 30, an Air Force uh, shooting medal that he got. Uh-huh. It's called a oh, leg medal. Yeah. Uh, I, I was able to wear, allowed me to wear that on a uh, uniform. Right. And uh, uh, a number of 45s and so forth. This was belonged to my grandfather um, in the, on the ranch down in Quero. Mm -hmm. And I kind of thought myself out of shoot with that when I was about 12, 13 years old I see. during the war. Wow. And on Walton uh, Drive. Mm, yeah. When there wasn't anything else. Well, there wasn't anything back of us. And the the um, post oak trees in the backyard have a lot of 45 scars on Wow, that is quite a collection. My goodness gracious. We've gotten uh, picked up stuff from, from yeah. all over. Yeah. Uh, you might uh, be interested. Okay. A couple of things back here. Brazos Valley Voices is very proud of its relationship with the Brazos Valley Veterans Memorial. It's tucked away in College Station's Veterans Park and Athletic Complex at 3101 Harvey Road. It's a hidden gem for sure, a 12-acre site dedicated to veterans from our nation's major wars. The Brazos Valley Veterans Memorial includes life-size statues, a wall of honor, interpretive panels, and memorial sites. It was chartered in 2000 as a nonprofit corporation. The Brazos Valley Veterans Memorial is supported by generous community residents, organizations, and partners, including Brazos County and the municipalities of Bryan and College Station. The Brazos Valley Veterans Memorial's all-volunteer board of directors proudly contributes their time and resources to salute our veterans. Their mission is to proactively pay tribute to veterans through an educational venue where future generations can learn that freedom comes with a heavy price. Former President George H.W. Bush helped dedicate the Brazos Valley Veterans Memorial on November the 10th, 2002. Bush said at the time, the Brazos Valley community can stand proud. The names that mark the memorial showcase the sons and daughters who gave dedicated service to our nation so that future generations can share the freedoms we enjoy. Their task was great, their sacrifice even greater, but their legacy stands firm and their memories burn bright. Bush later said the Brazos Valley Veterans Memorial is a similar quality to those at the famed mall in Washington, D.C. Within the Lewis L. Adam Memorial Plaza sits the 250-ton red granite Wall of Honor, which serves as the memorial's focal point. The wall bears the etched names of more than 5,000 veterans representing all periods of U.S. history who are family and friends of Brazos Valley residents. Notable names include 24 presidents and former Texas A&M University students who received the Medal of Honor, the nation's highest military award. 
The bronze sculpture mounted at the top of the wall depicts a GI carrying a fellow soldier to safety. The statue is the work of artist Robert Eccleston of Schuyler Falls, New York. Do you have a beloved veteran that you would like to add to the wall of honor? The veteran may be living, deceased, or active, and does not have to be a Brazos Valley resident. The cost is $150 per name, and the application deadline each year is August the 15th. New additions are recognized at the annual Veterans Day ceremony. Names received after August 15th will be recognized the following year. For more information on adding your loved ones or your name to the Brazos Valley Veterans Memorial Wall of Honor, contact the BVVM at 979-696-6247 or email them info at bvvm.org. Or you can go to their fantastic website. It's easy. bvvm.org. Bvvm